Hello tout le monde, bienvenue au podcast de l'Acadie Lacadjone. And today, well, we're doing our second one in English and uh, we are actually doing a podcast with a young woman who's done viral YouTube videos on Louisiana, Louisiana Creole culture, Cajun culture, and a lot of things that has to do with Louisiana. Uh, Madame Caitlin Diculus, I pronounced your name correct, I hope. Yes, you did. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Um, anyways, we were just talking about the Festival Acadie et Creole that's happening. We're, we're doing this podcast in March. And uh, yeah, good times in Louisiana this time of year in March. I'm, I, I assume that the weather is great. It's beautiful. Festival season. It's festival season. Season Festivals like Acadie et Creole usually happens in fall. But because COVID happened last year, they canceled it. This is just sort of a lanyop, an extra one that they've added on for the year. And yeah. they're going to have another one also. Yeah, actually, Barry told me they had to cancel in October. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah unfortunately, and all that. And uh, like I told you, I, I truly appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Uh, I always love having people that are passionate with the culture, even though there's a large geographical differences and we have two different cultures we are so linked and I truly appreciate you taking the time and everyone listening is it does appreciate that. So anyways, yeah, I mentioned that she's, uh, she's done viral YouTube videos and all that. Let's kick, let's talk about that. Caitlin, as a young woman, you were a young woman when you did, in fact, you were probably, you were still probably in university or just, or, or college or wherever you went, you probably just left or whatever. As a young woman at that age, what, how did that passion and drive got to you at that young age to make some YouTube videos about Louisiana culture? Well, I was 22 when I made that first video that has the most views on it. And actually, I had just gotten married. Um, <laughs> I was married in my early 20s. And um, just that, that passion that I had. It's just always been in me my whole life since I was young, since I was little. I've always been a person that's like passionate about my family and just like my heritage and my my culture. Um, my family's always been really close and tight knit. I mean, the extended family, too. We would always get together for New Year's and have a big gumbo. The whole like the extended family would show up. And um, my grandfather, Eli, he and I share we have like some soul, some soul connection and he's just always been passionate about family too. And that was instilled in him by, by his dad, my great grandfather, these, this on my father's side. And, um, I just always looked at old pictures with my grandpa, Eli. And he, I always went to him and asked him the same questions over and over again about family and like, where do we come from? And he would, he would tell me the stories every time and talk about the old people. And um, I just I just sat at the feet of my grandparents a lot, like a lot when I was a kid and just heard their stories and took in their wisdom. And it just sort of like that, that energy was just like instilled into me from a young age. And nobody knew that it was I didn't know that 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 was happening, but it just got forged into me. So when I, when it came to making that video, it was sort of like, you know, when you love something so much, it just like pours out of you and inspires other people, I guess. Like I just had so much overflowing in me pride about my heritage and my culture that I just wanted to share it with whoever wanted to watch. And I made that video and, uh, it's like a crazy, crazy amount of people watched it, um, on YouTube and, um over time it's it's i think it's been up there about seven years now and i think anytime you type in louisiana culture creole cajun that algorithm into youtube like my video pops up and uh that's just really cool and i was young when i made it and i kind of didn't know all of what i guess like as much as i know now of what i was talking about maybe <laughs> but um that was that just showed like my passion i guess like it, it just overflowed absolutely and like 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 seriously like i became passionate about my culture when i was 20 and i never could have seen myself do youtube videos like that i, mm -hmm. I i'm serious you know that's 
that I was seriously impressed because when I first started, or actually, I don't know if if it's when I first started thinking about doing my podcast or whatever, but all of a sudden I, I said to myself, I got to research Louisiana because I didn't really understand Louisiana. I still have a lot to learn, but I do believe if I recall, like you pointed out, you search on YouTube, Louisiana culture, who pops up? You. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I remember those videos and yeah, you know, it's, it's such a credit to uh, your passion and Louisiana Creole culture, you know, and like, it's like you say, it has to do a lot with your grandparents and boom, mm -hmm. boom, you know, yeah. and you know, uh, a lot of our listeners are in, Lac in Lacadie, of course. Would you know any Acadian last names you have in your family tree? Just so we can have a connection with our listeners. You know, I, I will say that that's not something that has been like, that's not really part of my, my culture coming up. Um, there's last names like Mitchell, Michelle. Um, I think that's, that's an Acadian last name, or I don't know if that was um, a last name that came down in the derangement though. Um, and uh, Lejean, Lejean is one, but those names are like few and far between really. Um, a lot of my heritage does not come from the by way of uh, Acadie. Uh, it's like direct France or uh, Quebec, uh, Montreal, people that came through Canada, but not necessarily Acadie. I know it's in, it's got to be in there. You know, we have so many people in our lineage. It's um, I haven't gone back too far personally, but my sister has in our family tree. Um, but that's not like the Acadian, Acadian heritage, probably not a whole lot in my, um, in my family. Um, a lot of, a lot of French though, by way of France and other avenues through Canada. Yeah. Down to here. But Jan, Lejean and Michelle, definitely like a Lejean, Lejean's in there somewhere. Yeah. That's what I assume because Mamu was actually it's Barry also that explained that to me. He particularly talked about Mamu to me is that it was mostly more Quebecois than Acadien there, actually. That's what he told me. Okay. Yeah, yeah okay. that's what that's what he told me. So, you know, I, I can I can believe that because uh, we'll get to that soon, but uh, the Acadian populations was mostly in the Bayou regions, right? And all that, from my mm -hmm. understanding, you know. Okay. And uh, obviously we're... Uh, we're French and we always have an interest with last name. Could you please explain to us your last name, Diculus? And uh, I do believe there's a French origin with a different name there. Am I correct? Yeah. So yeah, it's Deculus is, or a uh, Diculus. It will be how my grandparents would say it or the elders in my family. But five up to five generations ago, there was an Eli, Eli Luculus or Luculus the first. My grandfather is the fifth. Yeah, so three generations ago, I believe it was three generations ago, it changed from Luculus to Deculus. My grandpa always told me it was because that grandfather that changed the, the name, when he did change it, he wrote the, the L like a D. So it changed to Deculus somehow in paperwork. Um, I guess people weren't as... Um, weren't as not articulate, but illiterate maybe. So that's how I understood it whenever he told me as a kid. So I said, okay, well, I could see how if someone wrote an L that another person back then might decipher it as a D. But as I've thought about it over the years, I think it happened, the, the change happened because uh, maybe the family went off in a different, like pod, clan, say, you know, like different, different um brothers that were luculus one maybe kept the luculus last name or lucullus last name and then another one wanted to make his own like clan pod family and he changed it to deculus so i feel i have a feeling that something like that happened um and that happens that happens like five generations back or um rather three generations back and the last name Luculus actually is traces back to a uh, BC times. 
Um, you can look it up. You can type in the name Lucullus on YouTube, on um, the internet, and someone will pop up named Lucius Licinius Lucullus, and he was a Roman general. Um, and I think like he was born in one, 118 BC, and he was like consul to Rome. Uh, so the last name Lucullus goes as far back as that. <laughs> and uh, so um, I don't have any documentation on my paternal, on my dad's side, that Lucullus last name passed that first Eli Lucullus the first. Um, I think there's another elder in my family that's done research on it. Um, and I could ask her it, what she has about that, about where they derived from. But um, I feel like that's my journey to like do do my own research on. Um, and the time will come for that. It hasn't come yet, but um, maybe when I have less on my plate, <laughs> when I'm a little older, maybe. Um, I want to do that research, go to the courthouse, go past that Eli the first and see where, where did they come from? My grandfather always told me that we came from Greece, though. When I was little, he always said our people come from Greece because I would ask him where our last name came from. And Greece, Rome, connection somewhere in there, um, I guess. So back to Rome and Greece would be where the last name traces from. I'll tell you something. Uh, when the time comes, I would love to hear what you find <laughs> because there's yeah. going to be a lot of digging. I'm going to tell you it's, that's very descriptive and all that. And I can tell you right now, uh, like a D, my mother told me this like 10, 15 years ago. And I, I can't fully prove it, but I'm like 98% sure this is true. If you have any come in you, which is a Cajun last name too. Mm -hmm. You're related to a lot of those French kings. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That, that's that's something else. That was a royal last name then, Como. I can't I can't confirm, but I do know there was relations. Yeah. Okay, very cool. Yeah, and that's might be one of the reasons why the Acadians came to the New World, because they didn't allow just anyone in. You had to be a certain status, believe it or not. Uh, like okay. it was I don't know if it was who you knew or uh, it was a trust thing, but you were basically going into a territory where, you know, something I'm not going to speculate too much because obviously uh, I'm not an expert, but I can tell you right now, I can tell you, they did just let anyone in Lacadie. Like just point out to our viewers that she has spent time in the Acadian region, the Acadian region I live in, at La Baie saint Marie, went to the French immersion program, and we will get to that very soon. So we talked about uh, your grandparents and all that. Do you have any other memories as a child that would relate to Louisiana culture? Because that's probably an important time to get attached yeah absolutely so again elders spending time with elders and just visiting old people my dad always brought me to visit his aunts and uncles which would be my great aunts and uncles and their kids extended family um i did a lot of that when i was growing up with my dad with my grandparents too i spent a lot of time with them on the weekends i, I still do um they're in their 80s and um, a lot of time just growing up country, growing up living in the country, farming with my, my grandparents. Uh, they had a little farm. They would grow snap beans and mustard and cucumbers. And we'd go over there and help them pick and plant and cut okra. And um, my mom and dad had a, had, a little, had a little farm too. They had chickens and, and ducks. So just like a real humble upbringing uh, close to the land. And I would spend a lot of time with my grandparents, like I said, and I would ask them as a child, Mama, granddad, that's what I call them. Just speak to me in French. Just speak to me in French. As long as I can remember, I wanted, I had that desire. It was something elusive. It was like a mystery to me and something that I wished that even as a little kid, I'm talking like four or five years old. I had that in my head. I was like, I wish that I would have grown up 
from birth speaking this language. Um, my dad worked, my dad speaks French. My grandparents taught all their kids French. And um, it was that generation that sort of like, they didn't speak French to their kids, my dad's generation. So like your baby boomers and below that. And I would ask my dad, I would beg him like, speak to me in French as a little kid. And he would be busy and working and um, he'd say, go to your grandparents' house, go learn, go talk with them. So, so I did. And um, they would speak to me just in French. They obliged me. They spoke to me in French and I listened and I understood well and I comprehended. I couldn't always respond as elaborately when I was little, but I understood every word. And when I went to St. Anne, so many things came back to me. It's, it's things that are, they're pathways that have been paved already in my mind. And when I went there, they woke up because I walked back. My mind walked back on those same pathways. So there was a lot of light bulb moments I had at St. Anne's. It was, it was beautiful. Yes. And certainly we will get to that very soon, but yeah, that's uh that's an answer I did not expect. And, uh, you know, I think you probably s requested your grandparents to talk to you only in French, maybe at the age of five or six, because if you would have been only, if they would have only spoken to you in French as an infant and you would have spent a lot of time with them, you probably would have picked it up. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's, that's, the, that's the thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's another thing. I don't want to talk too much. Like I, I sh probably should say, I probably shouldn't be talking too much about that. But, you know, I, Louisiana culture is still vibrant and all that. You know, we, we know it's not just French here, but French is a big thing. It's, I, I think it's still a big thing. You know, you listen to music, the, the French music and all that in Louisiana. There's still a presence. But how about, here's a question for you. When you were a child, teenager, you and maybe your friends or your acquaintances in school, did it bother you and your friends and acquaintances that you didn't understand French? Now we're yeah. we're talking now we're talking like the entire school here. Are we talking about everyone? No, um, I would say culturally though, like the majority of us, we knew all most of our grandparents all spoke French. Um, I'm 32, so. We took French in school from fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh, could take it all the way up to 12th grade um, French class. So there was always the question amongst me and my peers, we would ask of our teacher, um, well, you know, like, I, I like learning, we would say I like learning French because then I can talk to my grandparents. But then there was always the conversation of, oh, this isn't the same exact French as our grandparents are speaking. Why can't we learn that French? Why aren't they teaching us that French? These are questions we would ask as kids to our teachers. And, you know, they would explain to us, um, oh, well, you know, this is standardized French. This is the French that's in the book. The French that is spoken at, at home by your elders is not necessarily a standard French. So there was always something I can speak for myself. Um, there was sort of something there that put it lower, you know, put our mm. French low mm -hmm. and in our grandparents' mind too, because they were told not to speak French when they were kids and they were beaten for it. And I'm sure you've heard all about that. Um, so there's always this like second rate classification going on with with the French in Louisiana. Um, and I think that a lot of us as, as kids, we, we didn't like that. You know, we, we didn't like that um, because, because we knew our grandparents spoke French and it was just fine. But um, there was always a little bit of angst, I think, inside of us. And there were some of us that were more passionate about it as kids than others. But it was a pretty across the board question that kids would ask to their teacher. Why can't why can't we learn the French that our grandparents are speaking? Like, yeah, like I can only talk about the dynamic we had here at La Bessette, Mari. Like we were told we spoke wrong for years. Yeah. 
But mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you a little something. At the same time, all of our French courses were academic French. I, I understand academic French. Mm -hmm. uh, no problem. I, I, I speak it. I mean, I'm not used to it, but if I would speak it for just a week, I, I it would come back, you know, and all mm -hmm. that. And it's one of those things that even in France, la francophonie, you know, a lot of spots in France, like southern France, like uh, like some of these regions get ridiculed because of their accent. Mm -hmm. You know, well, I've heard that. You know, and that, that there's insecure insecure. Insecurity, linguistic, in, linguistic insecurity, yeah, that's in France. Mm -hmm. That it's surprising and all that, and that's a factor about your grandparents. Uh, I don't need to know if they were beaten in school, but if any, like in, somewhere in your family, someone was punished for speaking French in school. I'm sure you know. And <laughs> what does that do to a language? That's violence on the language. Yeah, that's violence on the language. Now we were told we were spoke wrong and all that, but my generation were basically, oh, we're like we say in Canada, we're dropping the gloves and we're standing up for the language, you mm -hmm. know. And in Quebec, it's the same thing. There's a lot of regions in Quebec they speak like us a la baisse and or I should say they have the same words, but mm -hmm. they speak wrong. We have mm -hmm. the, the the perception in l'Acadie that in Quebec, that's good French, which is, you know, I'm not going to say that word on our podcast, but you know, and, uh, in Quebec, it's the same thing. They look at France, they think that's good French, but in France, there's so many different dialects. There's some dialects in France that I can't even understand what they're saying. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And it's just like in anywhere has accents and has their own dialect going on you know like someone can come down here from arkansas and i can have i can be having a conversation with one of my friends and use all kind of language that they won't i'll be speaking english but they won't know what i'm saying absolutely <laughs> code. code switching code switching uh if mm -hmm. you've ever spoken to people in newfoundland or cape breton here in canada yeah it's sometimes Hey, I can understand like three or four words they're saying, and after that, I'm good. I don't need to know the sentence. I know what you're saying, okay? Uh, Kate Is that or because of words? Uh, sentences, words, accent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Newfoundland, they actually say where you're at. Where you're at. What you're doing. Okay. okay. Yeah, I did. Like, where you're That's something that I'm familiar with hearing in Louisiana, too, where you're at. Probably more like down towards New Orleans, though. Yeah, right on. Yeah, that, that's the thing. And I mean, it's like I said, here in Lacadie, I think my generation were really standing up for the language. I only knew a few years ago that in the Moncton area, they spoke so much like us. You know? okay. And I've got a cousin there, a cousin that's Shiak, which Shiak, mm -hmm. you know, you, I, don't, I don't know if you're familiar with that term, but that's basically... A lot like Akajan, other than it's in southeastern New Brunswick. That's what they yeah. call their way of speaking, which is so much like us. A la Bay Saint Marie, right? And I've got a yeah. and I've got a young cousin there that I've spoken quite a bit of standard French to for years. And I'm just catching on now. We speak so much alike. What's the where was that gap then? Um, did y'all see each other often? I saw her a lot, like um, but yeah, like I saw her a lot. Like I remember, like she's younger than me. She's 25. But I don't know, for whatever reason, I, I think it might have been because she spoke more of a, uh, of a standardized Canadian French as a young child first. Okay. And then she started speaking more uh, Shiak when time okay. came. I think that might have been the factor. It's kind of weird. Okay. It's kind of weird because, uh, you know, uh, I never thought of that, but. Hey, you gave me a question. I gave you an answer. Yeah. What time, an awesome time, you know, that's the thing, mm -hmm. you know, and, but yeah, you know, and even, uh, I've done some podcasts with some people from the Bathurst area, Northern New Brunswick, mm -hmm. and we understand each other and they say a lot of the same words that like we do, you mm -hmm. know, and obviously, you know, actually I think we're in sync of a topic uh, that we're going to talk about in a second. 
Uh, but to understand Louisiana better, there's three geographical locations. I would say New Orleans, Acadiana, and the rest of Louisiana. What, and I apologize, I don't know what you call the rest of Louisiana. Well, I have this map right here on my wall. So I would say you got the New Orleans area that's down the east. Um, then you have Baton Rouge and Lafayette. And then you have Lake Charles. This is all along the southern part. So basic. Oh, actually, there's the state back there. <laughs> so um, I'd say so. you got right here is the Lake Charles area. This is Texas will be on this side. OK, so we'd call this southwest Louisiana. And then I'm from about right here in the middle, which is almost getting to Sinla. We call Sinla, which is central Louisiana sort of in this area, around the ankle, you'd say. And this is probably Baton Rouge about right here. We call that no man's land, just kind of tongue in cheek because there's not a whole lot of music scene or, or French that really goes on there. Uh, as far as like pop culture, I'd say, like in Lafayette. Uh, Lafayette has a lot of very strong music scene with Zodico music and French music and Cajun music. Um, and people singing in French, and we have these festivals, Acadien Creole. Um, there's a lot of cultural, pop cultural things that happen. And then New Orleans is down here. It's kind of cut off, but yeah, down there. And all this area up here, North Louisiana. <laughs> like Once you get past this place we call Alexandria in central Louisiana, North Louisiana, um, and they really do speak different. They, they, they have a really different accent up there. It's markedly different than we talk down here. It sounds a lot more like your typical, when you think of a typical Southern American accent, it's very rhotic, you know, rhotic versus non-rhotic. We're very non-rhotic in South Louisiana. We drop the R's off of everything. Like um, the, uh, just like a TH sound, you might've seen in one of my videos, I mentioned that, um, the, the TH sound, it turns into like a D sound. And I think that actually ties back into French, uh, pronunciations in French historically. But North Louisiana, very twangy, very rhotic accent. They'll have a harder pronunciation of an R on their words. Um, yeah, when you think about your typical Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama accent, that's sort of us in South Louisiana. That's kind of what we think about how they sound in North Louisiana, right? But there's of us. There, there. We're all Louisiana. We're still, we're still, we're still one. That's, so that's sort of the reason. Yeah, right on. And there's one thing I've spoken to some people from Louisiana, and there's one thing I was very surprised to learn. Okay, the French words aren't really dead. Okay, uh, there's. In fact, you even talked about that in one of your videos. I was surprised that you use a word to describe a mosquito. Uh, Maringouin, you say? Maringouin. Maringouin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how we say it here at the Bay St. Marie. Uh, Maringouin, okay. we call it, right? And uh, I probably shouldn't be saying that, but uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it. You don't have to say it, but uh, I have the foire. Yeah. yeah that's, well, do you have any more examples? Huh, let's see. Um, Just off the top, you're talking about words that I would just say every day? Sort uh, of in place? Yeah, yeah, more or less, yeah. Hmm. Um, so like envie, I said that that one just comes to mind because someone and one of the elders in my family used that word earlier today. Uh, I got the envie. I got the envie to go dance tonight. Um, or even just words like personally me. Words that I can recall very quickly in French. I'll just replace the English word with it. Like like I would have just said, I got the envie to go danser ce soir. You know, there's a lot of that like Franglish going on in my in my mind um and especially when I visit my grandparents it's like something clicks on in my brain and I want to my brain wants to go to that place and say as many French words as I possibly can to them um or Lumiere I got the Lumieres on um um 
Femme Laporte. Uh, I'm just thinking of like random things I would say um, during the day. Um, I don't know. I can't really think right now of like particular words. I said a lot in that video, you though did. a lot that I would that I would use often. Yeah, and everyone check out her videos. And yeah, you know, there's one thing I actually saw, and we're gonna get to a few of the things. But I know uh, we're gonna talk a bit about something that I, I that really struck me. I watched uh, the film La Vey, right? And you guys, mm -hmm. you and Marshall. Marshall Woodward, who was the the, film, the filmmaker, yeah, you guys went to see a person named T Boy, and I started thinking, why do you call him T Boy? Is it the Tiga, the translation, as in T Boy? If you read me what I'm saying, like here in Lacadie, we say uh, like uh, our musician T Bilivo, Petit. Little, right? You know that word, of course. And that's the that's the thing that we say a lot in Lacadie. Yeah, like in Lacadie, we say piti, ti believe and all that. And I was wondering if uh, it was kind of like the same thing as T boy. Do you know that? Well, I don't know what you're referencing particularly there. That T go. Yeah, like um, like the T would be like piti. That's what that's right. the impression I got. It is to say like the the younger the the young boy so i have an uncle daryl and he he has a son named daryl also so we call my cousin daryl t t daryl or lil daryl so t boy in the in the in la Vey, the film that's probably a name that he, that he's had his whole life because that's what his family would call him so it is that that's what it is um it's to say like the t the junior or the younger one, the small one. Yeah, that's an observation I made. It was just like a brainstorm all of a sudden, like that's something, yeah, we use a lot here. So that's mm -hmm. that's very interesting, the French influences that are still there. Like yeah. I, I, I for, for years, I thought it was completely anglicized. Ugh. But yeah, I mean, yeah, it very oh, Louis yeah Louisiana has, although we are, I would love to have more, French language permeating the culture here. I'd like to see signage in French everywhere. Um, I would love if our politicians made it required that it was like New Brunswick where we had bilingual road signs. Um, but the the culture really, the, the language really does still, even though people speak English solely, people still are very much connected to their French heritage or their French, the French language. Uh, a lot of people probably use words they don't even realize are French. It, it's just things that they've heard all their life, and they were raised saying them, so they say them. Yeah, I get you. We're actually supposed to have bilingual signs at some point here in La Bay, okay. which Parabo would get also, right? Bilingual signs because of and one of the factors is a 2024, right? Congra and all that. So uh, do you have anything else to add regarding Louisiana pride, culture pride, Louisiana culture pride? Yeah, I'd say our cooking is a giant part of our of our heritage and identity. People that call themselves Cajun or Creole across the board, one of the unif our the things that hold us together are food. Uh, because that also brings family together. When you cook, you invite people, you invite your family, you invite your friends, and you just hang out and you have a good time. And we cook for a long time. Uh, we smother a lot of our foods, which is very French. Um, and we cook for hours. Like we'll cook a, a gravy for five hours, you know, five hours. And you're just drinking and visiting with your family and having a good time. Um, so cooking is a big, huge part, giant, giant part of our of our culture um, and dancing, having a good time. Uh, you know, like I I guess our people here, not just the French, we're talking a lot about French, but there's a lot of other people that are here and, you know, historically came here and we've all gotten mixed together. A lot of those people went through difficult times and hard times and 
uh, poverty, slavery, um, being kicked out of places because of what they believed in, um, or like the indigenous people too, the, the native people that were here, you know, they were chased out of a lot of the places that they were and they had to go to far reaching lands into the Gulf, you know, close to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, I think with those hard times, our ancestors really had to find what joy that they could in life. So, you know, that's why we like to dance. We like to spend time together. Um, just humble, humble things that we're really humble people down here, I think. Absolutely. And you have to listen to your music, like the music in Louisiana, I should say. I haven't heard one depressing Louisiana song. You haven't? Not, not yet, because it's all dancing and all that. Right, it, yeah. It, I think Acadian music, it's more or less like that. Very few depressing songs. I can, mm -hmm. think, I can think of a few, but I guess I suppose it's kind of a different dynamic here. Yeah. Re regardless, if, I mean... Hey, it's good stuff. Bottom yeah, it's line. yeah. People are having a good time. You know, a lot of a lot of the French songs that come to mind with me, like the Balfa Brothers or like Austin Pete, um, uh, Nathan Abshar. A lot of those old Cajun French singers they sang a lot about like heartache, and they have a lot of songs about heartache and um and falling on hard times um you know there's a lot of like drunkards waltzes um <laughs> um they it's sort of like it connects to country music if you know about country music in the in the united states um it's like the blues they say is the white man's blues well um a lot of that french music has that vein running through it too um but you'd never know it like the people that don't speak french but just go and dance to the music they never know it because the beat has you wanting to dance. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. And it's like, we talk about that around here. It's like the perfect thing to connect it to cultures. It's the music. Mm -hmm. I, I totally get that. I totally get that. And there's one thing I think our listeners would be interested to know. Uh, we touched, I, I should say, I touched that with Barry Asa last time. And I think it'd be, it would be a very similar definition. Please give us your definition of the term Creole. Okay. That's, yeah, that's a, a big old tangled web. So, so my definition of Creole, I go with, so from my lens of being a Creole person, a Creole, Creoles are people that are mixed with many different things. You can be mixed with, different so let me go from the angle of what is what is creole on the books so for example your heritage could come from directly from france your ancestors and you then you have some ancestors from spain and say you have some ancestors from um some some native some native indigenous people here well that can be creole if they were here at the time of the colony, people mm -hmm. that were trace your ancestry back to being in the colony, doesn't matter what that comp comprises of. It can be straight French from France. Also, it can be Acadian mixed in there too. Um, that could be classified as Creole. Um, a lot of people don't classify that. You know, um, a lot of people that will say that they're Cajun don't say that they're Creole, but if they have Acadian heritage, but they also have direct from France heritage and some Spanish mixed in there, then they, their definition Creole, but that's sort of like not the way that people define themselves. Um, my definition of Creole, from my standpoint, being a Creole person, I mix with a lot of different things. Um, I can trace my ancestry back to my people came here during colonization. Um, I have French ancestry, I have Spanish ancestry, I have African ancestry, I have native ancestry, German, Irish, Spanish, Italian, um, Iberian Peninsula. Um, that's, that's my, that, that's, that's my identity, my Creole identity. Um, 
but the uh, yeah like i said the definition of on the books of being creole could be anybody that can trace their ancestry back no matter what it is back to a time when louisiana was colonized because they're those people were born in the colony making them creole creer create um it's different nowadays people define it differently because racial 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 differences so um it's sort of like split down the middle cajun would be defined as a a white francophone speaker and creoles to some people would be black or mixed francophone speakers or historically you know french um in their family and mixed people but um i don't know i i take a that that's something that I um, that I carry um, an opinion about because um, we're we're mixed we're mixed here, and I understand that a lot of people do have heavily heavily like Akadi like that French ancestry in their heritage, and some people have like the majority of that, but I would. I don't like how those two terms have have become so racialized before I was born, you know, like back in um, in the times of segregation, you know, when when things were going on in the United States with segregation, those things were being like mirrored here with Cajun Creole. It got split down the middle and um, you don't have to be any particular skin color to be Creole. It's about what you can trace back in your in your bloodline and um yeah i just i I just don't like how racialized it is and um people some people that do define themselves as cajun if they can look back in their history and see that they have some mix in there well by definition they would be creole but because the term has been racialized and the term creole has been become synonymous with like black or or mixed people some people don't want to touch that. Some people that would that would um, identify as white or Cajun, they don't want to touch that. Yeah, because I actually talked to Barry Osala about this, and for the longest time, I thought that Creole was solely the people of color in Louisiana. I, I swear by it. I, it's not. I'm just being honest. That's what I originally thought, and when I looked more into it, I'm like, I'm so confused. I got to ask Barry what's the, what this the term Creole is. Because yeah. I was picking up all this information and all that. And I do know that you're, before we even spoke uh, <laughs> spoke before the podcast, I knew this was something you're passionate about. I do know that you've been involved in meetings with people with different races. I should say meetings. I do know you were, I saw there's even a news article online that you were all gathered. I think it was in the Catholic Church. People with different races talking about your Creole identities. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and all yeah. that. And I saw that, you know, you didn't show that emotion like you did on that media outlet that interviewed you. But I do know that was something you were passionate about. Is there anything else you want to say about that? Hmm. Um, I guess that's part of my... I don't have it clearly outlined what that looks like for me Um to, to pass on to people, I guess, maybe just by talking about it like this and being like a face, putting a face to it, um, to that identity that like, let's dissolve this like paradigm of like Cajun is white, Creole is black. Like we're one culture and we all came together here to create what we have. And I would just, maybe, like I said, maybe just, that's just what my role is just like to talk about it and be a face for it, um, be a different sort of face for it, um, for people to realize that it's it's not this down the middle thing. Like we're mixed, a lot of us are mixed and that's okay. Uh, some of us aren't and that's cool too, but this contributing this part of the culture to this side or this part of the culture to this side, I want, to, I want that to be dissolved because we came together, our ancestors came together here to create what we have here today. And um, I just, 
I have this mindset of acceptance of wanting us all to accept each other as brothers and sisters, as we are on this, on this planet as fellow human beings and skin color doesn't matter. Really blood doesn't matter. Like we're all human. Yeah. So. Yeah. And like, I see a lot of people in Louisiana with the last name Thibodeau, LeBlanc, mm -hmm. people of color, right? And when I see that, and a lot of people here, when we see that, we automatically know there's some Acadian lineage, you know? Yeah. And it's like, you know, these Congra Mondials and all that, that we have, I mean, it's so great because, you know, the Acadian history and all that, Grand Derachement, 1755 and all that. And when we can reconnect, it's such a powerful thing. Yeah. You know, and yeah. seeing someone, whoever it is, with that last name coming here, you know, I saw an NFL player with the last name Thibodeau that's projected to go third overall, a guy of color, you know, like, it's pretty cool. Do you typically see at, like, Congre and things that happen in, in Canada, do you typically see people of color? Do you see people of color? Are they sparse? Or do they go to those events? Or... Are we talking about direct Acadian lineage? Oh, I guess um, I'm just asking, like you, you mentioned like Congre um, and sort of like these events, these cultural events where people come together um, in relation to a lineage. Um, do you, is it, do you, do you see anyone of color there? Um, or is it like a large amount, a small amount? Last Congre was, was in 2004. It was a different time. I saw, okay. and I didn't go to many events, to be perfectly honest with you, I was 20 years old and, you know, uh, I was, you know, uh, anyways, I was there for a different reason, but at the time, but I saw zero people of color, but 2024, there's more people of color in the region so, okay. you know, now, as you know, right? So you, you'll, you'll see people of color in 2024 here. I, I can tell you that, you know, it's, but I mean, you know, it's, like the Acadian regions, you know, came from France and all that. But, and now, you know, there's different races in our, in our regions, <laughs> you know, and there's a thing called adoptive Acadians now, you know? I mean, you, you, you embrace the culture and I mean, I think what isn't there to love, you know? I'm a little biased, <laughs> but you know, what isn't there to love? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, times change 2004 and 2024. I mean, a lot of more immigrants come to Canada now. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a uh, known fact. I don't even need, need to get into details. Immigrants are coming to the United States too, but yeah. in Louisiana, there were uh, people of color and all that. Like, for example, I've got two, I've got three, sorry. I've got three little cousins that are mixed race. Mm -hmm. And and they can't speak French, but if you tell me they're not Acadian, buddy, yeah. you, you might, after the third time you say that they're not Acadian, okay, then I'll give you an earful. Yeah, that's their identity. Yeah. That's their identity. They've got, through their father's side, who's colored, and their mother, who's my cousin, you know? Mm -hmm. Here's something I've been wanting to ask you for a while. Mardi Gras. Mm -hmm. That is such a fun time. One region to Louisiana to the other, I've been told that is celebrated differently. Am I correct? Yeah, you're right. Um, I haven't personally been anywhere besides Acadiana, besides the rural community that I grew up in for Mardi Gras. But New Orleans has a whole, they have a whole different thing going on down there. They have, they call them the Mardi Gras Indians. Um, you can YouTube videos and you can see they have these, massive beautifully ornate giant headdresses and and costumes and um i really don't know the history on it so i can't i can't tell you exactly but they they have parades they have a lot of parades in new orleans um where i'm from in mamu or the prairie we call it the prairie um there's we do the chicken run the courier de Mardi Gras. so as you might be familiar with we go from house to house. We start at seven o'clock in the morning. Um, we meet at one place and that's the place that we return to in the evening. But 
we go throughout the countryside on foot. Um, some people ride horses. Um, in in these more recent years, people will drive trailers, uh, pull trailers on trucks, but we'll go from house to house and we'll sing a song to the voisins, to the neighbors. And it's a, it's a song that sort of goes like, Doné quelque chose pour les mazis gras. It's like, give me something, please. And the people will give you like pennies or like little snacks and stuff. And you sing them a song and you dance in the front yard. And those neighbors will either go on top of their house or they'll stand on top of their truck and they'll have a live chicken. And we have a capitan, a captain on horse. And he lets us know whenever that voisin, the neighbor throws that chicken, then we Morty girls, we go run after the chicken, chase it, grab it. And you get to keep it. You get to keep that chicken. Um, but say historically, that's the chickens that would go in the gumbo at the end of the Mardi Gras run. After we've gone all day from house to house and collected the ingredients for the gumbo, historically our ancestors would have brought it back, cooked it all for a gumbo, and they would have ate the gumbo, drank a lot of more alcohol, danced a lot, and finished the night off with eating the gumbo. Um, these days, the gumbo is already cooked <laughs> whenever we get back to the place. So, um, but we still, we still carry on that, that exact tradition. So I've got a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, we messaged each other. How come you were sore this year at Mardi Gras? How come I was what? Sore. Because I'm just curious. Was it all the running? I want to know what's going on in Mardi Gras and Mamu. Yeah. So, yeah. So, there's a lot of there's a lot of mayhem and chaos. So uh, to be a good Morty girl, you'll be a person that's being mischievous. So a good Morty girl is somebody that'll you go tease, you go tease other people. Like you'll go like pull on their costume or um, playfully push each other in the ditch and get each other muddy and sort of like wrestle in the ditch um, or in mud mud piles. <laughs> Puddles, um, that happens all along the way. There's a lot of drinking, um, and the colder it is, the more drinking people do uh, to try to numb themselves from that cold. Um, this year's Mardi Gras was pretty warm. <laughs> it was a warm Mardi Gras. But um, it was good to be back doing it since we didn't do it for the previous year because of COVID. So it was really nice to to have that back, um, that just be together as a big family. It's... um. It's a pilgrimage. It's really a pilgrimage. And I think it's a really, really important part of our our culture here in Acadiana um, and in the rural areas, because this is something where your community, your friends, your family, you come together on that day and you proceed for hours on foot, picking up ingredients, just bonding. It's a It's a wonderful bonding experience to have with all ages too, it's not just just 30 or 20 year olds. Old people do it too, every generation does it. And I think that's important. Having generations weave together in that way, continuing to pass on wisdom, knowledge, tradition. Absolutely, yeah. Like here in the La Bessette, Mari, this is a tradition that's been going on for years. I don't know if you've ever heard this or not. Ever heard about the canoe trip we have here? No, I haven't. Easter Friday, canoes and four-wheeler. Concession to Salmon River. Okay. Two days. But the first day, that's the most popular. Okay. So it's in canoes in the in the in the river? Yeah, it rivers, yes. And I think there's yeah, there's some lakes too, but yeah, it's like first day is mostly lakes, the second day is mostly rivers. And camping along the way? No. No, after the first day people pick people up because well, there's a lot of alcohol involved. Water out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Anyways, but yeah, like, yeah, it's kind of like our Mardi Gras. That's what I tell everyone. It's, okay. it's, uh, yeah, it's like those tradition. That's like a tradition here that we don't really, I, I don't know. We, we don't view it as, 
a, a big thing, but for the community, that's like uh, people come from Alberta and wherever they're from just for that event and we all meet up. I haven't done it since 2003, believe it or not. But yeah, people meet up at that event. It's a pretty cool thing. Okay. So it's like that. It's like that community bonding. Yeah, that, absolutely. That reunion. Yeah, there's. I find this, there's a lot of Vispi Acadia there. A lot of what? Acadian spirit. The Acadian spirits, it's a lot there. Yeah. Okay, that wraps up part one with the podcast with Caitlin Dickulis. Make sure to listen to part two. We talk about her time at the French Immersion Program at l'Université Saint-Anne. Tout le monde, faisait sur l'écoute. See you later.